hook you up. Just make sure you don't go to the bathroom with the microphone on. <laughs> um, I'm Paul Miller, and I'm a uh, I'm a nephrologist by formal training, and I ended up being a bonehead. It's a long story, but um, I run a private practice in Denver. It's called the Colorado Center for Bone Research. I've had it there for about 35 years. It's a very academic private practice. I have fellows who rotate through and third-year medical students, and and um, but I'm not paid by the school. I don't want to be under the dean's arm, um, but I have to run a business too, which is done by a lot of people who work for me. So I can focus on what I love to do, and that is take care of patients and and come here and give lectures and write papers. And um, But um, what happened was I did my internship and in residency in internal medicine at the University of Rochester. And when I was at Rochester, there were some real icons that started uh, really this whole field. The one in Rochester was Larry Royce, the one with Michael White, who's here, with Mike, was Lou Avioli from Barnes. And uh, Larry Riggs at the Mayo Clinic, who's now retired down at his old home stomping grounds in Little Rock. But Larry Royce had a big influence on me. But there were no, there's no fellowship program in, in Bone. There still isn't. And that's one of the themes that we're trying to work on at a national level so we can get a, a formal um, fellowship program started. So there's a consistency of training across the field. Um, but uh, so uh, the other area I was very interested in was salt and water metabolism. So I went out to Colorado to do a nephrology fellowship under one of the big salt and water men there, Bob Schreier. Um, and I studied a lot of the ADH work. And we, we, we worked on the non-osmotic control of ADH release. But during that time, the people there knew that I had this interest in calcium. So on the GCRC, I started to do some work in lithium and bone because lithium stimulates PTH production, and that's why it would, also the calcium can go up, so it, it can mimic what looks like primary hyperparathyroidism, but it's not, um, obviously, it's due to lithium. And anyway, so as the world evolved, and I evolved in this field, uh, I, I left the school full-time and, and joined a nephrology practice where I, started, I added the name Western Nephrology and Metabolic Bone Disease. And, and that after a while, the whole field, I started to get a lot of, I still have a lot of Paget's patients, Oxygenesis Imperfecta. Uh, we started to see some of the early hypophosphatasia. Um, uh, TIO, other rare bone diseases. And I left them in my nephrology group uh, because they didn't want to do any bone and opened up the Colorado Center for Bone Research. So I have, uh, and I do all the bone biopsies for the Rocky Mountain region. I probably do 40 or 50 transiliac biopsies a year. A lot of those are in research patients that are in clinical trials because the FDA requires a certain sample size to, uh, for having biopsies. So those trials come my way so I can do the biopsies. And then um, um, I see a lot of, I see about 80 patients a week. I'm a very active, and they're complicated, and I'm very intense with them. I'm lucky that I, with all the changes in medicine with electronic health records I have a scribe uh, so I can really focus on and talk to the patients because I'm a real believer that humanism is critical in the field. And if you, one of my favorite phrases is, if you lose humanism in medicine, we lose the, we lose the profession. It's a real um, theme that you'll hear. So anyway, uh, let's talk about bones and the kidneys. And... Um, um, So, you know, as we um, age, GFR goes down. This is, this is, this is by estimated GFR, uh, by the Cockcroft Galt or the MDRD equation. It goes down around 1%, one, 1 to 2% per year from about age 50 or 60 on. And that's age-related reductions in kidney function. So a lot of the data I'm going to show you, from at least when we get to the clinical trials, are not people with known intrinsic renal disease. Uh, with proteinuria and diabetic nephropathy. But this is simply age-related reductions in GFR. And one of the big research projects that's some, sometime, either in the nephrology field or the endocrine field, somebody's going to apply for an NIH R01, will be to see if the patterns of all the things that we study in, are different 
in patients who have age-related reductions in kidney function versus reduction in kidney function due to a known intrinsic renal disease. The biology may be completely different, and that's, that's really unknown. So uh, chronic kidney disease is increasing as we live longer, and uh, stage 3 CKD, which is a GFR of 30, 60 to 90, of course, the National Kidney Foundation is broken down to 3A, 60 to 45, and 3B, for, because it's a wide spectrum there in stage 3. And that's the greatest proportion of the people that are going up when it comes to different stages of CKD. Um, the, um, and of course, that's lot, aging, diabetics, and, and unrecognized high blood pressure. We know that low bone density predicts an increased risk of fracture, and that's heavily age dependent. So in postmenopausal women, or in men, for every decade over 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, the fracture risk doubles by decade at the same bone density. Now part of this could be related to, when we're up in here, a higher risk of falling. But a lot of it is even independent of falls. And it's due to the fact that there's another component of bone strength that represents 50% of bone strength Half of it due to bone density, and the other half is due to bless you, due to bone quality. Bone quality are the microarchitectural changes in bone that deteriorate with age that make an older bone more likely to break than a younger bone at the same bone density. And one of our great limitations in the field right now is the talk that I gave at the NIH a few months ago when they had a two-day workshop on some of the implementation gaps in, in the nation was there, in, we don't have an office-based tool yet for being able to measure bone quality. We can measure it by a lot of research tools, high-resolution CAT scan, micro MRI. But once we develop an office-based tool that's uh, reimbursed uh, to measure bone quality, it'll help explain a lot of the abnormalities, people that fracture with perfectly normal bone densities, like the diabetics, for example. Now, most of you won't see stage 5D, stage 5 CKD. This is patients on dialysis. And by the time they get to this stage, they're usually managed by the nephrologist. And I'll tell you, as a, as a card-carrying nephrologist, when I give talks at the American Society of Nephrology meeting, fundamentally, nephrologists know very little about bone metabolism. It's amazing how this gap between what they take care of in terms of the patients on dialysis and their knowledge about um, bone. And ultimately, they will look toward you uh, to get, their, get advice on these particular group of patients. But fracture risk is very high in this group and, it, and is associated with incredibly high mortality uh, because of the comorbidities that all these patients have. So the one-year mortality after hip fracture in somebody um, with CKD, 5, is about 60%. It's incredible, whereas it's about 15 or 20% in people age at the same age without CKD. The issue is the fact that it's just not end-stage renal disease. All stages of CKD have higher fracture risk than age-matched patients without CKD. And this is a slide. Uh, you, you get all these slides, don't you, on the little disc? Yeah. Um, this is a slide uh, looking at uh, different population studies uh, of people with even a GFR of 60. You'll see close to a doubling of the odds ratio of all fractures in this group as compared to people of the same age, same body mass index, same BMD without CKD. So there, there are abnormalities in, in the, when you get to 60 particularly that make the bone more fragile. Now one of the things, you've heard about fracs, I'm sure, the fracture risk assessment modeling, the 10-year fracture predictability based on risk factors. Now fracs did not include CKD in their model simply because they didn't have enough sample size of patients to validate that as an independent risk factor, but it's there. So at, at the bottom line, 
what I do fundamentally is take any frac score and double it below 60 milliliters a minute. So it's a very high risk of, of group in that regard. So the question comes down to why is bone strength impaired in CKD? Um, because it gets into the whole issue of ultimately what we'll talk about is how to discriminate, I mean, how to use a T-score, um, which can make the diagnosis of osteoporosis by WHO, World Health Organization criteria, and apply that to a group of populations where that wasn't validated in. But it, there's a, it's multifactorial. Uh, people have secondary hyperparathyroidism. They retain phosphorus, and that can lead to a whole cascade of events in the bone itself. Actually, phosphorus uh, retention will lead to, to impairment of bone mineralization, and often what looks like on biopsy, an osteomalacia picture. Elevated FGF23, and FGF23 is a phosphatuic agent, but it may have some direct effects on mineralization in bone and impairing mineralization. Chronic metabolic acidosis, whether it's an anion gap acidosis, which is usually not chronic, like diabetic ketoacidosis, but the non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, the renal tubular acidosis, is associated with decreased mineralization and often osteomalacia. And these people have sarcopenia. There's a muscle conference going in a different building across the way today. Um, you, we lose muscle mass as we age. We lose muscle mass with CKD. They fall more, uh, they're more frail. So this is a slide that uh, we published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease from myself, Stuart Sprague, who's a nephrologist interested in bone at Northwestern, and of course, Elizabeth Sheen, who's with John Bilziki at Columbia. And you know, it's, it's kind of a complicated slide, and that's probably the reason why. But I think what I wanted to point out in this slide is the fact that the osteocyte, which is the producer, in, uh, in, in normal people, not TIO or, or FEX, but um, FGF23, and FGF23 leads to a lot of phosphorus wasting. It may have some direct effects on the uh, osteoblasts. Um, and th this is all related to the regulation of serum of phosphorus by PTH going up with phosphaturia, FGF23 going up with phosphaturia, and probably FGF23 goes up far sooner than the PTH goes up. The, um, and I, I, I put this in here only because Clotho, because um, on board exams you'll hear about Clotho, or maybe you'll look. But it's a co-receptor for FGF23, but it also can act independently um, as a um, hormone. Um, and affects uh, wind stingling as well independently. So the boss in the cell, in the bone, is the osteocyte. It's the dominant cell in bone, far more abundant than the osteoblast or the osteoclast. And the osteocyte has a whole cascade of, of control mechanisms. It's the manufacture of FEF23. It's the production of sclerostin, which we'll get into that in inhibitor of the osteoblast function. Uh, the osteocyte also sends up little canaliculi to the surface of the bone, and probably through sclerostin going up through the canaliculi, it regulates bone formation with mechanical loading. So when you mechanical load a skeleton, you can go from, gra from no gravity, let's say for the astronauts, to simply gravity. You don't have to jump up and down and have 10 pounds of weight. Simply gravity itself will uh, probably lead to reductions in sclerostin production to the surface of the bone and allow the osteoblasts that are on the surface of the bone to make more bone. Um, and this was all defined. Actually, the mechanostat, the original genius behind the mechanostat was Harold Frost at um, uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Uh, one of the, years ago, one of the major powerhouses of bone. Okay. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of crosstalk between osteocytes, osteoclasts, and osteoblasts. And a lot of these are crosstalk between rank ligand uh, production, which is um, both seen 
maybe it may be even more from the osteocyte than it is from the osteoblast. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. Anyhow, um, so sclerostin, uh, it's, you know, which is produced in the osteocyte, in CKD, serum levels go higher at each stage of chronic kidney disease. And it could explain, potentially, the adenonic bone disease, a low bone turnover uh, that is seen in people with uh, more severe CKD. Adenonic bone disease is seen where, where, you say, where you're not making bone at all. There's no tetracycline labeling on the, on the, on the biopsies. Uh, is far more common than simply the diabetic population. It, uh, uh, and it may re be related to the sclerosin. Um, Serum levels are also high in diabetics and could explain the low bone formation seen in diabetics. Serum levels are higher in younger patients with fragility fractures. We see a fair number of the, like Elizabeth Shane and A.D. Cohen from Columbia have published people who have, have spontaneous fractures that are otherwise perfectly healthy uh, through the femur. The atypical femur fracture pattern that is, is traditionally described with bisphosphonates. But we have a whole uh, group of of these patients, and we've sent a lot of back to New York for Elizabeth Shane's NIH grant for studying. But on biopsy, they have low bone formation, and it may be related to the sclerostin. Their sclerostin levels are elevated, and we don't know why. Um, you'll see um, GLP-1 agonists reduce sclerostin. Monoclonal antibodies sclerostin may offer a novel antibiotic therapy for osteoporosis, and this, this is developed by Amgen in the terms of romososomab, monoclonal antibody to sclerostin, and we'll get into that in a little bit. This is a slide showing that each stage of CKD, serum levels are higher, and it's not related to decreased clearance. This is related to overproduction. FGF23, again, has broad uh, uh, modalities of action. It's more than simply a regulator of phosphate handling. And again, it affects PTH, it affects mineralization. This is a very complicated, again, typical complicated slide of FGF23, but as a phosphatuic agent, but it has other actions as well. What regulates FGF23 production? Well, it's probably retention of phosphorus. That's probably the main regulator. As soon as the phosphorus level gets retained with CKD, which begins around 60 milliliters a minute, you don't see hyperphosphatemia at 60 because the FGF23 and the PTHs are high to keep the, uh, and ultimately that, that mechanism, that control mechanism is overwhelmed when you get to 30 milliliters a minute, even though you have high FGF23 and high PTHs, they're not able to do enough phosphaturia when the GFR gets that low so they can become hyperphosphatemic. <clears throat> even though the phosphate retention occurs earlier, you don't see in the blood test hyperphosphatemia until about 30. Um, the uh, FGF23 um, in, uh, in actually inhibits calcitriol production, uh, and low PTH increases P FGF23 production. So one of the questions that comes down to in the pragmatic world of real medicine, should you be ordering an FGF23? And this is a slide that I actually presented for the first time in 2012, and I was fairly negative about it um, uh, because there, there are clinical circumstances where you should certainly measure. In CKD, I'm not quite sure because we have no way of, you know, what happens with FGF, FGF23 is, the, is the, probably the most important risk factor for mortality and, and cardiovascular mortality. Of course, the left ventricular hypertrophy. So you have a patient in front of you who's on dialysis or something, you're on FGF23 and it's 2,500. What are you gonna do about it? If you give them a monoclonal antibody to the FGF23, which was developed by Ultragenics, um, for the treatment of TIO, it simply drives the phosphorus up. And phosphorus is a killer. Phosphorus retention is a killer. You should order it certainly in people who have persistent hypophosphatemia with phosphaturia. Because 
<clears throat> I often say that the kidney is the smartest organ of the body. It keeps what it wants, it gets rid of what it doesn't want, and it has a cortex. The urine phosphorus will go to zero very quickly when you become hypophosphatemic. It'll just go it shut down to nothing. You'll see no phosphorus in the urine. So if you have hypophosphatemia and you have phosphorus in the urine, it's renal phosphate wasting. That's, a, that's an important clinical pragmatic point. <clears throat> and if you have renal phosphate wasting, <clears throat> then you should get an FGF 23 because it could represent that you're dealing with somebody with tumor-induced osteomalacia, the small mesenchymal tumors, which can be the size of a thumbnail and located anywhere in the body. I found them in patients under the pituitary gland, above the ethmoid bone. I found these in the greater trochanter of the femur. <clears throat> and if you remove these mesenchymal tumors that overproduce, then they're cured. A lot of times you can't find them and if you can't find them, then you have to order the FEX gene, which can look, FEX and TIO look identical. Phenotypically, they look identical. They have hypophosphatemia, phosphaturia, <coughs> um, they have elevated FGF23. <coughs> they can, uh, uh, on bone biopsy, look like they have osteomalacia. But the FEX, we don't know where the FGF23 comes from, FEX, which is XLH. Uh, X-linked hypophosphatemia, but the, um, uh, they look alike separately. So you have to order the FEX gene, which is very expensive. It's about 2,500 bucks commercially a pop. Uh, but you might treat them the same way um, with a monoclonal antibody to FGF23. In the TIO patients, if you find the tumor, you remove it. But in the meantime, if you can't find it, um, the, the monoclonal antibody FJ23 is a very incredibly effective treatment. In patients with a normal 25 but low 125 and normal GFR, uh, that's one of the po possible causes of is FJF23 because FJF23 inhibits 125 production in the proximal tubule. In people who have unexplained elevated BSAP, we'll show you the slide of the differential diagnosis of the 10 or 11 things that can be, can be associated with elevated BSAP. And uh, one of these could be unexplained osteomalation, that could be FGF23, and uh, renal tubular acidosis, which may have some association with FGF23. So in the, in, in the critical question comes down to in practice. When you have a, a patient with CKD, whether it's stage three or four or five, and they're fracturing, and they have a low T-score, is it osteoporosis, as we think about it, the, the NIH definition, or is it a fracture related to, the, to one of the causes of renal bone disease that we'll talk about? So what is osteoporosis? Well, this is the NIH definition, and it stands, even though this was um, published in 2000, it really has stood the test of time and it's valid. It's a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength, predisposing to an increased risk of fracture. Bone strength is a composite of bone density, which we can measure in clinical practice, and bone quality, which we can't measure yet in clinical practice. Um, that's, that's, the, that's really a, a superb definition of what osteoporosis is. The clinical risk factors for osteoporosis in CKD are multiple. Often the people on dialysis, hemodialysis, get chronic heparin, which can lead to bone loss. People or have diseases, whether they're lupus or vasculitis of some type or Wegener's granulomatosis. They are on steroids, post-transplant, hypogonadal, they're often hypogonadal, even at young ages, because they're sick. Hyperprolactinemia can be seen, which in prolactin can inhibit can lead to osteoclast activity, poor nutrition, vitamin D deficiency, hyperparathyroidism. So all these com individually or combined multifactorial can lead to uh, skeletal loss of, of a mineral. Fractures, in, in the, from a pragmatic point of view, the question that will come down to you, is this fracture a, a form of renal bone disease, such as hyperparathyroidism, a dynamic, 
osteomalacia, or is it osteoporosis? I mean, that, that's really the, the working group because you're gonna treat hyper, severe hyperparathyroid bone disease differently than you treat a dynamic bone disease, than you treat potentially osteoporosis. The clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis in certain populations, uh, postmenopausal women, elderly men, can be based on two things. A low trauma fracture of the wrist, vertebrae, hip, probably tibia, pelvis, some of the fractures that were captured in FRACS, the major osteopathic fracture group. Um, but before you say that, you have to rule out other causes as well as fragility fractures, or whether they have OI or osteomalacia. WHO criteria, a T-score of minus 2.5 or lower, which was really developed, and, and people don't live in the world, the WHO criteria was never intended to be applied to individual patient care. It's a health economic modeling. The World Health Organization is interested in world health. And since fractures are going up worldwide and costing each healthcare economy a huge amount of money, and once somebody's had a low trauma fracture, if they've remained untreated, their risk for the second fracture goes up enormously high, and often within the first year. So the WHO wanted to define how can we how can we detect how can we define how common the prevalence of osteoporosis in Sweden, in Germany, in Brazil, in Philippines by a bone density level in people who have not yet fractured. So we could say to the and, and we had to develop a threshold to define it. And you picked out the T-score, which is the number of standard deviations that your bone density is above or below the average for the young, healthy population. It was called the T-score, by the way, because it was named after Tom Kelly, who is a vice president of Hologic, who helped fund the study in great ways. But anyway, um, the... Um, uh, oh. Anyway... Um, and so they picked minus 2.5, and that was chosen on the following basis. If you look at the proportion of Caucasian women living to 90 who have a hip fracture, it's about 20% of the population. And if you average the T-score at the hip between the age of 50, which is the average age of menopause, and 90, 20% would be minus 2.5 or lower. There were people on the WHO committee who wanted the number to be minus 3. There were some who wanted to be minus 2. Minus 2.5 won the vote, and that's how it was ultimately. In fact, uh, an epidemiologist at the Mayo Clinic, where Bart Clark, the current president of the ASPMR, who's retired now, Joe Melton, when the WHO first came out and they were going to use minus 2, he wrote an editorial in the Journal of Bone and Mental Research saying, how many women have osteoporosis? And then when the final vote was minus 2.5, a few months later, he wrote the second editorial, how many women have osteoporosis now? Because their prevalence would differ according to the threshold. Um, <clears throat> and, and what they wanted to do was to see how many people were minus 2.5 or lower, they were asymptomatic, they were healthy, through, in, in different world populations. So they could say to the governments, let's say of Sweden, you know, 60% or 20% or 40% of your population over 60 or 70 or 80 have osteoporosis and X number of people can be expected to fracture, and this is gonna cost you X number of dollars. This is a health, health economic modeling. And of course, the 3% and 20% is also a health economic der der derivation, uh, where it became cost effective to treat at a hip fracture of 3% or higher, or major fracture of 20% or higher. That was all based on the cost of alidronate at that time, which was 600 US dollars a year. So now that we have generic alidronate, you would treat everybody. And if you looked at the health economic modeling with, let's say, for Teo or Timlos, you treat nobody. So just that's one of my little pet peeves about it. Um, anyway, so that's WHO criteria for, for what it worth, but we have to live with it because patients come in and they're scared as hell because they have osteoporosis. Diagnosis of osteoporosis in patients with known 
reduced GFR. Stage one to three, 90 to th use the same thing. You can use WHO criteria, you can use fractures, as long as there are no biochemical abnormalities suggesting that they may have something else. And I'll take, show you that in a minute. The, 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 the um, term is CKD-MBD, chronic kidney disease, mineral and bone disorders. We'll get into that. Stage four and five, you cannot use T-scores. The, 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 and you cannot use fractures to make the diagnosis like we can with other people. Because by the time you get to stage three, or stage four and five, the other abnormalities that can affect bone, elevated PTH, low 25, or whatever it may be, become so profound that they affect bone strength independent of, let's say, age-related reductions in, in B BMD. The Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcome, KDGO. Uh, this was a group that was organized by the uh, National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology. We've met twice uh, in Munich. Uh, the last publications were here. Sharon Moe is a wonderful um, nephrologist at the VA hospital at the University of Indiana. But what they tried to do was to, to incorporate all of the abnormalities that occur with CKD, with phosphorus retention, elevated FGF 23, elevated PTH, and come into a definition of a condition that was called chronic di kidney disease mineral and bone disorder. And what they tried to do was to link the phosphorus retention ultimately to the systemic vascular problems that can occur with CKD, which is the major uh, cause of mortality. So this is the definition, and it becomes a little bit um, not very pragmatic in terms of its ability to apply it in clinical practice. A systemic disorder of mineral and bone metabolism due to CKD manifested by either one or the combination of the following. Abnormalities of ca calcium, phosphorus, PTH, or vitamin D. Now they've added FGF 23 recently. Adrenalize and bone turnover, mineralization and volume, blah, 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 vascular soft tissue calcification. They're all fine and they all are linked. The problem is that there's no billing code for this. So you can do all the mental work that you do in discussing this and thinking about it. When you have the patient in front of you and you say, well, I think you have CKD, MBD. Well, say, well, doctor, what does that mean? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure, but I can't bill for it anyway. So I, 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 I just don't think this is going to go anywhere until you can apply this in a more pragmatic way um, and articulate this to patients and get paid for that time. Stage four to five CKD, where you can't use WHO criteria, may have CKD MBD, which is clinically suspected if the patients have either an elevated serum phosphorus or elevated PTH. PTH begins to go up at around 60 milliliters a minute. This is from uh, Levin, but a lot of the work has also been done at Stuart Sprague at um, Northwestern. And you can see the lower your GFR, the higher the PTH levels. Secondary hyperparathyroidism, what causes it? Well, you can get low 25. They're often nutritionally deprived. And that leads to hypocalcemia, which stimulates PTH. Calcium malabsorption or intake, like, like a celiac patient, will often have secondary hyperparathyroidism just simply because they're in negative calcium balance. And it doesn't take very much changes in serum calcium to affect PTH production. Hypercalcuria can lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism. Chronic kidney disease and acute renal failure. A low 125 despite a normal 25, because 125 feeds back on the PTH receptor and can inhibit PTH production. So if you have low 25, 125, PTH goes up. As I mentioned earlier, lithium, and of course the, the calcium agents, the agents that have been developed to treat the secondary hyperparathyroidism, um, and the ones that bind to the calcium sensor receptor and lower what the P PTH molecules uh, thinking what the blood calcium is, and, and PTH goes up. 
So the diagnosis of osteoporosis in stage four to five is a diagnosis of exclusion. The gold standard is transiliac bone biopsy. It's quantitative, double touch of enable quantitative histomorphometry. It's not practical. Not many people around the country do biopsies. Um, there's a handful of us around the country that are biopsiers. Uh, the people at Barnes, Steve Teitelbaum, who's a pathologist actually at, at WashU, uh, Stuart Sprague at Northwestern, Susan Ott up in University of Washington, Seattle, Ira Saluski at uh, UCLA, uh, Miller in Denver. Um, it's, there's just not a lot of people who do this. So we try to look at it from a biochemical point of view. Um, stage one to three CKD rarely have been associated with adenomic bone disease, unless there's an underlying condition that can be associated with uh, low bone turnover, diabetics, aluminum accumulation, reasons for our stimulation, which I'll talk about in a minute. Stage four to five are, is really where the struggle comes down to. So as, as I mentioned, it's, a di it's an exclusion by biochemical profiling or histomorphometry. What about the biochemical profiling? Well, you know, I'm sure, I think Susan probably went through this earlier, life, life cycle of bone. You know, you and I, I, I tell patients, uh, you and I have about 10 million little microscopic cavities throughout our skeleton. Each one is called a BMU, or bone remodeling unit. And within any one unit, there's a fixed program. It takes about 30 days to carve out old bone. About 90 days to fill that cavity in with new bone. That's called the remodeling cycle. This is going on all the time throughout your skeleton at different stages. The major purpose of remodeling is to repair little stress cracks while you're walking around the um, Orlando Convention Center. <laughs> Uh, but from the collagen of the bone and from the cells that do the work are released in the bloodstream, a group of proteins that collectively are called bone turnover markers. And they have a lot of value uh, uh, in spite of Doug Bauer's recent letter to the editor in JAMA, uh, poo-pooing. I'll see Doug in a couple of days. We're on a committee together. And, it, and I, wrote, I wrote a letter to the editor of, um, you know, debating the, uh, his negativity about bone tumor markers um, because this final sentence was, bone tumor markers have no place in clinical practice. I said, I'm going to say to him, Doug, you just put the field back 10 years because, because the insurance companies are looking for any excuse at all not to pay for these, and they're expensive. And that'll be another nail in the coffin to trying to you know, resurrect <laughs> bone tumor markers. But anyway... So you have activation, resorption, reversal. This takes about 120 days to do. And of course, these markers are released into the bloodstream. And you have resorption markers on the left-hand side, formation markers on the right-hand side. The two that are really clinically used and now have been the, the, the preferred markers of, of a lot of organizations um, is the uh, for, for bone um, um, resorption, the, the serum levels of, of c peptides, CTX, formation, the propeptide type 1 collagen, the P1 and P. Now, when it comes to the kidney and these markers, some, some are cleared by the kidney and some are not. Three bone tumor markers unaffected by GFR. The bone alkaline phosphatase, which I think has had a lot of value for other reasons as well, the P1 and P trimer, that's the one that's measured, but there are two immunoassay machines that measure these molecules commercially. One is the IDS, immunodiagnostic system. They're based in Phoenix. Their headquarters is in London. And of course, the Roche Diagnostic Machine, which is in Roche Diagnostics is in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, I've got both of them because I'm trying to standardize the assays, but the um, the P1 and P, uh, that's uh, truly only available right now in the US, is, is the one that's unaffected by GFR, and that's the IDS P1 and P trimer. TRAP5B is a very good resorption marker, but it is unaffected uh, by GFR. CTX is. CTL peptide, you'll see people with GFR of 30, 
and the sheet checks of, let's say, the upper limit of normal in most reference ranges is 650 picogram per milliliter. Somebody with a GFR of 15 or 20 will have a sheet checks of 1,200. Simply as a function of the fact that it's clear by the kidney and, and it's retained. TRAP-5B would be the ideal marker for bone resorption, but it's unavailable commercially, at least at the current time. So P1 and P is synthesized by and within the osteoblast, and it's secreted onto the, in, onto the surface of the bone of the, of the osteoblast, and there it's cleaved into P1 and P and P1CP. Uh, the um, assays that uh, are, are, are much more are better are the, are the P1 and P rather than the P1CP for different reasons. So again, the only one approved for P1 and P, which is the one that's not cleared by the kidney, is the uh, IDS um, immuno, radio immunoassay or the, or the immunoassay. Um, again, it's, it's having problems with the FDA. They, they all do because the FDA is very um, reserved on these markers. For me, it's a bonehead. They have tremendous value in, in management of patients. Um, this is just uh, shows the line of identity. Carl and Sonia is at Yale. Uh, actually, Carl is one of my interns when I was chief resident of medicine at the University of Rochester. But he, uh, they looked at the co uh, correlation between P1 and P by, done by radio and on the on the horizontal axis and, 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 uh, and just plain immunoassay on the vertical axis to show that they were, were identical. I've gone through this before, and I think um, so. In in practice, the two diseases to avoid turn, turning bone turnover down because people will come in, they'll have fractures, they'll have low T scores, and, and they'll have CKD stage four, and somebody will say, "Well, they got osteoporosis because they have a low T score, or they have a fracture, and therefore we ought to use polia or, or bisphosphonate off label." I'll tell you about that in a minute. And I say, well, we've got to think about this because if they have adenomic bone disease or they have osteomalacia, these are two bone diseases which are low bone turner to begin with. And it doesn't make sense to use an agent that suppresses bone remodeling when you don't have any remodeling to start with. So these are the two major diseases that you have to think about uh, <clears throat> how we approach this. This is a slide of osteomalacia. This is... Um, all the pink is osteoid, non-calcified bone. And one of the things about osteomalacia, <clears throat> there's a specific histomorphometry criteria. You have to have a osteoid thickness of more than 14 microns and an osteoid surface percent. How much of the, of the bone surface in black is covered by osteoid? And it's got to be more than 80%. These are the two basic fundamental criteria for making the diagnosis. Osteomalacia always has a cause. And this is one of the things that I think is a, a, a kind of a beautiful slide to ponder. Probably ought to be in your head or think about this. Because if I think somebody has osteomalacia, because their BSAP is elevated or what it may be, what the, they have a cause. It doesn't happen. It's either a very severe 25 deficiency because you may not need a biopsy of these people. Because you ought to be able to find out if they have an abnormality, which you can correct and heal this. And the 25D levels have to really get down to low and for at least a number of months to, to do this. And usually you won't see it below until they're below 10 or 8 or 6 nanogram per milliliter. Chronic hypophosphatemia will lead to osteomalacia. And that's, this is an important clinical point, because if you draw a single level of serum phosphate, then it's low. You've got to repeat it a couple of times. Because when you eat a meal, phosphorus goes into the cell. When you give insulin, phosphorus goes into the cell. It goes in with glucose. So you want to make sure that it's, it's a consistently low serum phosphorus level, just not one single isolated uh, level. Vitamin D resistant rickets. Um, like XLH, renal tubular acidosis, oncogenic osteomalacia. 
TIO, again, the, the phenotypic pattern for this and for FEX, where they don't have a tumor, and no one knows where the FGF23 is coming from in FEX, XL8. Low serum phosphorus, high urine phosphorus, normal 25, low 125, elevated FGF23. So you can go with the patient you think, and you can say, look, I'm, you don't have this. I, you, or, or you do have it, and we, have a fan, we find the cause. Because if you find somebody who has elevated SBS, bone alkaline phosphorus, osteomalacia always has an elevated bone alkaline phosphatase. You will not see clinical osteomalacia without having an elevated bone alkaline phosphatase. The yak phosphorus probably goes up because, you know, the, the, the bone's trying to make bone, to, to mineralize bone. And that's an osteoblast function, and it just, and the yak phosphorus goes up. Um, <clears throat> so a biochemical test to screen for EDI, do a 25, do a 125, a serum and urine phosphorus, electrolytes looking for RTA. Uh, if you don't know whether the, the uh, low CO2 and high chloride is that or a respiratory alkalosis. You've got to do blood gases and a urine pH. When you do the urine pH, this is a pragmatic point, <clears throat> you have to have the patient pee in a little cup and pour mineral oil on top of it. So it traps the gases in the urine. And then you put your pH probe through the mineral oil down to do the urine pH. Otherwise, you'll get the gas will go up, and you'll you'll miss the uh, P, the, the low P. Uh, the, the, I mean, a pH in somebody who's in the metabolic acidosis, if they can't get their pH down below 5.4, they have a renal tubular dis, distal renal tubular problem, and of course, elevated BSAP. So, elevated BSAP also excludes adenomic bone disease. <clears throat> when I pre presented this talk about a year ago at the annual meeting of the American Society of Nephrology, Hart Maluka, who's the biopsy at the University of Kentucky, another nephrologist interested in bone metabolism, a good, great, great guy. He stood up and he said, Paul, I, I do think we can see it in, a, in biopsy proven adenomic bones if they've had a recent big hip fracture. Uh, so I put there, then I added, unless there's been a recent fracture. Um, but it does exclude a dynamic bone disease. And if you don't have an elevated BSAP, you don't have osteomalation. Those are a couple of pearls. Elevated BSAP, you can see it as a differential diagnosis. Severe primary hyperparathyroidism, I mean, but I mean not, not just mild asymptomatic primary, but severe primary hyperparathyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, more severe. Metastatic cancer in bone. Paget's disease. A recent low bo a, a large bone fracture, osteomalacia, severe chronic levels of low, tw low 25, space travel, immobilization, treatment with anabolics, teriparatide, abaloparatide, Romo, treatment with strontium, another simulation of the osteoblast. Uh, and I, so you have to go down here, and again, most of these can be ruled out clinically. What I do when I have an unexplained elevated BSAP, the first thing I do is get a total body radioisotope bone scan to see if they have any hot spots. Because if they have a lot of hot spots, it could be metastatic cancer of the bone. If they have one big hot spot, let's say in the femur or the radius, it could be pages. So I always then x-ray the hot spot. Because Paget's disease is an x-ray diagnosis, not a bone scan diagnosis. That's another key point to keep in mind as life goes on. But I do, I do the scan to see if they have a hot spot. Now, every once in a while in my career, I probably have about a 10 or 12 patients that have these quite high elevated BSAP, and I can't find a thing. And they have negative bone scans. And I don't know what the hell's going on. A few of them, I was talking to Mike White last night about the people that have some liver disease, some more severe liver disease, like, for example, primary biliary cirrhosis. Because, you know, the alkaline phosphatase in liver comes from the bile ducts, the line in the liver cells. And so maybe these people with, uh, with the 
um, biliary cirrhosis that have very high levels of total alkaline phosphatase, the assays become, I can't distinguish it, they're very low, high levels. But, I, I'm, but this is an important differential diagnosis in this thing, which you can click on. A dynamic bone disease is, a, is absence of single tetracycline labels. So here is a biopsy of a dynamic bone disease. This is, there's not much bone here. This is a vinyl strain. The black is calcified bone. This is the trap azer stain for osteoclasts. If you had osteoclasts in here, all these little holes would be filled with pink cells. They're osteoclasts. We see none. The von Kossa for osteoid, there's very little osteoid. And this is the, the most important feature, and that is this is a trabecular surface. And if you do tet tetracycline labeling, you should see yellow stains along here, and you don't. That's what it should be and you don't see it. Tetracycline is an antibiotic, but it goes in the bone as new calcium goes in the bone. It attaches to calcium as it goes in the bone. And it fluoresces under a fluorescent microscope. Well, that's why you don't give kids tetracycline, because they'll turn their teeth as they're growing yellow. Um, in the years, years and years ago, when we treated early whooping cough, in kids with uh, tetracycline. It was the only thing we had initially. They're gonna get yellow teeth. I've got yellow teeth. I almost died of whooping cough when I was about four. And um, uh, I had lost a tremendous amount of weight, you know. Living in a little town in Western Maryland. We had a good GP, Sidney Novenstein. Tetracycline came out. It was an injectable form, it's no oral form. He said to my father, who's a Lutheran pastor, not making much money, he said, um, we've we got this tetracycline, Ray, but it's expensive. It's $50. That was, his, that was his weekly salary, $50 a week. He said, I don't care. My son's, you know, boom, I got cured. But left me with yellow teeth. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> that's a personal story. But you should really be able to see tetracycline labels. So, so tetracycline goes as new calcium goes. So the way we do this, we give patients three days of tetracycline, 250 milligrams TID for three days. Then we wait 12 days. Then 12, after the 12th day, we give them two more days of tetracycline. Then two days after that, we do the biopsy. And one of the microscopes you put it under is a fluorescent microscope. That's a calibrated quantitative grid. And you can count the number of microns separating the tetracycline bands and then knowing the number of days to separate the administration of tetracycline, quantitate the bone formation rate in microns per day. And there's a whole menu of dynamic parameters that we have reference databases for to look at. Now, what about biochemical profiling for adenomic bone disease? Well, this is a wonderful study uh, done by Garrett published in 2013 in the journal, Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology, where they looked at all the data from different studies of about 1,200 biopsies, and then looked at different biochemical parameters to see how they predicted. The, the two that had the best predictive value were your own serum intact PTH and your bone alphas. And when you take a look at this, if you have a PTH that is six times the upper limit of normal, the upper limit is 65, so six times that, you do not have a dynamic bone disease. You probably have hyperparathyroid bone disease, if it's that high. If you have a PTH that's below um, 100, 150, there's a high predictive value for a dynamic bone disease. If you combine a PTH below 100, 150, and a BSAP in the lower quartile of the reference range, it, I mean, you've got a 90% predictive value for adenomic bone disease. So these are the two tests that you should be thinking about when you're screening for adenomic bone disease. And remember, you can only interpret the PTH in the context of people that are not on calcitriol Brocaltrol to suppress 
PTH or other uh, suppressors of PTH production. I think I've gone through this before with the, the BSAP. Okay, so that's me. Transiliac bone biopsy, you can do it with less pain than you can brush your teeth. That's what I, we put patients, out, outpatient OR, we have a, a, a net, either a nurse anesthetist or an anesthesiologist administer. I prefer propofol, because it's so smooth. Uh, if the center that I'm doing it at doesn't allow, sometimes they don't allow nurse, they can only use Versed and fentanyl, that's fine. Um, but the real key is to numb the periosteal surface. That's where the nerve fibers are. So we make the incision two centimeters posterior, two centimeters inferior to the anterior superior iliac spine. So, you know, take a Kelly, spread the fat. I can put my finger right on the top of the ilium. And then we numb that outer surface, probably with about 30 or 40 cc to 1% xylocaine. And then take a spinal needle with another 30 or 40 cc's, and then march it over the top of the ilium, and then go down inside the ilium, reflect it down inside the ilium to numb the inside. And then you take an, I, I use a nine millimeter Bordier Mounet needle, has an internal diameter of seven millimeters, and you point it toward the opposite shoulder, and you just go through, get your core out. Pack it with gel foam, big pressure bandage, tight ace bandage all the way around, recovery room for two hours, and then when they're driven home, because somebody has to drive them home after they're, they have, this is really a key thing. Stay down in bed for 24 hours, only to get up and go to the bathroom. They can have their heads up, look on the, on the watch TV, read, work on their computer, but somebody's got to be there and feed them. They do that, they never have any bleeding because if they have a bleed under the periosteal surface and stretches that periosteum, it hurts, it hurts and it hurts for a, couple, a few weeks. So I say, this is the key thing. Um, I, since I've been doing that and, and following these very carefully, I said, just don't get out of bed. If you get out of bed and you call me, you've got pain, I told you. I had one, one guy who, um, the biopsy was done at 8 o'clock in the morning. They were home by noon. He said, well, at 6 o'clock, we went dancing. Go figure. Anyway. So why is excluding bone turnover an evolving important issue? Low bone turnover is linked not only to higher fracture risk, but also a greater risk for cardiovascular disease. Low bone alkphos is the best test for possible adenomic bone disease. A low total alkaline phos is the best test for hypophosphatasia, HPP. If you have an, if you have an alkaline phos, it's total. Total alkphos below 40. You've got to think about HPP. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, we have about, oh, about two dozen patients with HPP. A lot of them are presented with atypical femur fractures, like you see with the athletes, like you see with bisphosphonates. Uh, but a low toe alpha is really the key. If you have that, order of serum phosphorus, they often have hyperphosphatemia. B6, vitamin B6 is often elevated. If we, if we have all that, we probably don't need to do anything more. Um, but if, the, if, if they don't have that combination, because it's not consistent across all populations, you have to order um, the um, genetic testing for HPP, which is expensive. Uh, although Alexian, the company in Boston now, they were in Montreal, uh, that has alpha taste alpha, the uh, molecule that stimulates the osteoblast to make alkaline phosphatase into the treatment for HPP, they'll, they often will pay for the genetic testing because this, it's expensive as hell. Um, alpha taste alpha uh, can, can be $180,000 a month. And now, fortunately, Alexian's got a huge patient assistant programs 
because I've got a few patients. I mean, nobody can afford it. I mean, no, no one can afford it. And uh, to, in order to get them this, this important treatment. So what do you do about the opposite end of the spectrum? A low BS, a BSAP. Well, there's a differential diagnosis for a low BSAP. HPP, renal adenomic bone disease. Treatment with prolia or an IV bisphosphonate. You can only interpret, if somebody's had denosumab in the last few months, they're gonna have a low BSAP. Hypoparathyroidism, John's favorite subject. Vitamin D intoxication, celiac, and I'm not so sure why it isn't celiac. There's a lot of things I don't know why, why it's, it's elevated. Um, but I think if, when I get down to this point, probably HPP, adenomic, anti-resorptive agents, hypoparathyroidism are the, the ones that pop up as the most common. <clears throat> now, low BMD can predict the risk of fracture in stage one to three, though the risk may be higher in patients with infringing renal, the, about age related, the whole issue I talked about at the beginning. DEXA is a poor predictor to discriminate between fractured and non-fractured patients and patients with stage four and five CKD. We do it not for fracture prediction, but for monitoring. We get a baseline BMD, and if we're gonna treat them with something, we'd like to see it change. And I went through this before with regard to the bone quality issue. So here is my office-based bone density tool. You can buy it for $14.95. You put the hand there, the hammer on a string, you, you, you take the, break it, the string, hammer goes down, and that's it. <laughs> 14. Anyway, so these are the tests. This is the high rose. This is what, well, John has one of these. I'm, 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 I was trying to get our group to get it. $800,000. Uh, <clears> this is a high resolution extreme QCT. There's a couple other ones that are now available. Uh, Ego Seaman, who's here from Australia, the guy with the burly curly hair, uh, he's developed a, a different uh, high resolution, more portable machine that's a real steel at 400,000. Um, but this gives you down to about, uh, uh, can give you down to 70, 80 microns. And the problem is that we have all this data, and this is, this is gonna be some of the future of development. You can look at this, and you can look at all these microstructural changes, but how to apply the numbers to fracture prediction is not well validated yet. Or to follow this longitudinally over time with anabolic agents to improve bone quality, what they do, connect to vector connectivity, but no one's looked at this over longitudinal in any pharmacological agent, whether that be abaloperatide, teriparatide, romososomob. So these are things to think about as you go along in life in terms of the kind of things that you would look for grant, whether that be uh, investigator-initiated trial from the companies, whether that be a clinical trial, whether that be NIH grants. These are, these are vertical fields. So the therapies, as you know, are down here. Again, when it comes to the treatment of osteoporosis, it doesn't differ between one to three CKD. It's when you get down below 30 that becomes a problem. Because some of those FDA labeling, some of that you have to use off-label. And the stage four CKD is off-label. So post hoc analysis, which I'll show you in a minute, show efficacy and safety through three years of recidinate, Alidronate, raloxifen, and DMAB down to 15, tear paratide down to uh, uh, 30. Recently, I'll show you some data that we're going to present on the battle paratide and also in Romo that I will present in the oral presentation here um, uh, on Saturday. I use these medications off label in people that are fractured. Because what happens, the people that I get sent to me by my nephrology colleagues are people that are often on dialysis or close to dialysis and they're breaking, they've had a hip fracture. And these people need help because they have an incredibly high mortality. 
And they, they look at me, and their families are there in the, in the exam room, and say, Doc, what are we going to do? Besides balance and fall prevention, all the things that we get on into, uh, we, we treat them. And it's off label use because the consequences of the fracture are so great. If you look at risk benefit, or even though we don't have any fracture data, but we know that anabolic agents can help in these people. Bisphosphonates, oral bisphosphonates are not recommended in patients with a creatinine clearance below 30. Um, 35 for zoledronic acid. Why the FDA made up discrimination, I don't know. It just confuses the damn field. And if you do enough EGFRs over time, <laughs> it'll swing between 30, 40, 20. If you do 10 in a row, it's not a very good test. If you really want to know what the creatinine clearance is, what the glomerular filtration is, a well hydrated 24 hour urine creatinine clearance is the best test. And often you'll see, this is one of my pet peeves, you'll see EGFRs that are 30 and a 24 hour urine creatinine clearance that's 50. I think the estimated GFRs overestimate the reduction in kidney function. That'll be one of my future pieces of work. Why is the FDA label like that? Well, you know, first of all, in the randomization criteria, for example, in the, in the uh, FIT trials, the Liternate trials, that led to Liternate Fosamax approval, they excluded people that were uh, not below, two, uh, or above 2.4. Oh, that's terrible. Anyway. Creatinine's a lot of patients were 1.5. If you have an 80 pound lady or man without much muscle mass from which creatinine comes from, comes from a high energy phosphate binding creatinine phosphate, and it's released into the serum at, at a constant rate, they may have a serum creatinine of 0.8 and a GFR of 20. So you have to put that in the context. EGFR was added, not in the fit, not in the fracture intervention trials. They were added in the horizon trials for zoledronic acid and the freedom trials for DMAP. It became a little bit more, a better way of, of inclusion exclusion criteria. The FDA labels also, because in the old literature, if you gave IV bisphosphonates too quickly, particularly Pavidronate or zoledronic acid, you can cause acute renal failure. Um, and of course, there was a, a concern bisphosphonates are cleared by the kidney, both by filtration and active proximal tubular secretion, so that their clearance is higher than the GFR. Uh, the, the FDA was concerned that you might retain more bisphosphonates and therefore have some kind of consequences. So this is one of my, <clears throat> you know, which measures you use? Probably, um, I mean, if, if, if the uh, lab reports automatically now give you an EGFR. That was part of the movement of the National Kidney Foundation. And if you take a look at the line of identity between GFR done by these variable equations on the left-hand side, on the horizontal axis, <clears throat> MDRD, <clears throat> right hand side, Cockroft Galt, and then look at the um, vertical axis, which is actually the, your uh, measure creatinine clearance uh, adjusted for body surface area. The, the, there's, a, there's a high correlation, but there's a lot of scatter around those lines. And that's why I think there's a problem. <clears throat> <clears throat> when we look at the GFR in the uh, Horizon trials, zoledronic acid, you'll see uh, th that the drop in GFR over time was very similar between placebo and treated. Why did it go down in the placebo group? This is the age-related reduction in the GFR. That occur as a process of aging. However, uh, we published this data. Steve Boonin from Belgium was the first author. There was a, a group of people who, if you take the serum creatinine in the first couple of weeks, you'll often see this bump. It comes back down, and this transient increase uh, is seen in not a lot of people, but it can be seen. 
Now, how do I approach this? Uh, I, mean, I think I have a slide, but just in case I don't. The FDA label says to give your reclass over 15 minutes. Give it over 30 minutes or 45. There's no rush. This is not ventricular fibrillation. If you give it over 15 minutes, you'll, you'll, it's because the damage to the kidney is related to the C-max from a pharmacokinetic point of view of the velodronic, not the area under the curve. So slow it down. What happens in today's health economic issues, everybody's got to make money. Everybody's judged how much money they bring in. The infusion centers went boom, 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 boom. But I make it very clear to the places that I send them my pay. I don't do it myself. My uh, infusion centers, uh, they, they, do, they can do all the pre authorizations and all that billing stuff. I don't have to worry about that. But 30 minutes. If you don't do that, I send them to somebody else. So the FDA with zoledronic acid it says perform a creatinine clearance, which is crazy. Doing 24 hour urines on everybody all the time is just impractical. But they did ultimately at this hearing accept that they'll do EGFR by Cockroft Gold. And yet most people now do MDRD. And they're, they're pretty close, but um, there, there may be some differences. Again, this is, this is my approach, because I'm the author of all these papers, <laughs> of um, managing renal erythrozole. Uh, it's due to the C-max, rather you know, give a slow rate, make sure they're well hydrated, stop their diuretics for a day or so before taking it, and avoid non-serial anti-inflammatory drugs. Because why is that? You know, you and I ought to regulate our blood flow if we could dehydrate it. So if you go out here for some reason, God forbid, you had a bleed, you drop your blood volume down 20%, your GFR, renal blood flow and GFR will stay the same. And that's because of the fact that there's intrarenal production of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are the molecules within the kidney that help auto regulate blood flow through the kidney. The non serial anti-inflammatory drugs abruptly stop intrarenal prostaglandin production. And you can induce acute renal failure in some of these people that are dehydrated but with Motrin, Aleve. I think when it comes to black box warnings, the over-the-counter non serial ought to have it. Because a lot of older people out there with aches and pains, and they reach up there and get this Motrin, and they got a GFR of 20, bam! Acute renal failure. You see it. This was the, um, the, the analysis that we did with the residronate data to show that the residronate at five milligrams a day uh, uh, reduced vertebral fractures across different stages of CK. The, 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 moder the severe were down to 30. We didn't have hardly anybody below 30 because the FDA doesn't allow that be randomized, but we didn't. We saw equal fracture risk reduction without any changes in GFR or creatinine over this time, down to 30. This was Sophie Jamal, Sophie's in Toronto, um, a paper with the Lindernate data showing very similar. The fact that the fracture risk reduction was similar at 10 milligrams a day of Lindernate in people who had. Um, mild, moderate, severe, this is down to 30 milliliters a minute. Nobody has any data below 30 in, the, in these studies. We did have some in the, uh, in the um, uh, Freedom Trial with, with uh, 60 milligrams of DMAB every six months. We had a few patients in here, but this is the reduction in vertebral fractures with placebo, um, um, the treated group across these levels of DGFR without a change in the um, creatinine. So DMAB did not alter the serum creatinine in, uh, from baseline over three years. And um, 
you know, there's a lot of vascular calcification. People were concerned that if you reduce remodeling, you get more vascular, vascular calcification. At least by x-ray, we didn't see that by lateral films of the spine looking at the abdominal aorta. Kind of a crude method, but that's the best there was. Teriparatide, the function of GFR, again, with the teriparatide group, we didn't have anybody below 30. But if you take a look at the people down to 30, uh, there was uh, reductions in, um, uh, no, I mean, no changes in GFR over time. And, and the fracture rates were very similar, reductions. Um, you know, Lilly studied 20 and 40. They should have gone for the 40 for approval. They were, I think they are over, underdosed it. I'll get into that in a minute. Bone density went up. There was no increase in stone formation. Small sample size, though. A biloparatide differs uh, from teriparatide because it binds to a different receptor configuration on the osteoblast, and uh, it increases bone formation with less inhibition of, of bone simulation of bone resorption. And that's shown here where you get uh, the stair error bars are very wide. These are very similar P1 and P's. CTX goes up more with teriparatide than it does with the ballo, and that might be a difference between the molecules. And, and uh, this is in the postmenopausal population, reductions in head-to-head -head data uh, but both non-vertebral and vertebral fractures uh, were similar. A balloparatide uh, uh, in CKD, this is from John's paper, uh, looking at changes in um, by tertiles of GFR. And this is the increase in bone density of the spine, total hip, femoral neck, at different subgroups by uh, eGFR showing very similar increases in bone density, down to 30. Um, in the safety population, they're very similar. You know, uh, a baloparatide um, will cause a, more vasodilation, because both teriparatide and a baloparatide vasodilate. So they actually are good for the kidneys. They increase blood flow to the kidney. They increase blood flow to the heart. But when you raise the dilate, you get a drop in total peripheral resistance. So you have to be quite careful with a ballo, because there you see more of this in terms of sudden positional changes. You know, you have to warn patients that if they're in bed or on the couch, don't jump up suddenly. Because, you know, we've had a couple of people faint, you know, got order cycle. <laughs> so they get up and let them lay, let them lay, you know, our, our tendency is get up and go. But you get up and let, just dangle your legs there, just like you do with a lot of high blood pressure medication. So a baloparatide, you've got to be a little bit more um, cautious in that regard. Now, one of the major problems with the clinical trials, in none of the postmenopausal trials, uh, did any patient who baseline PTH was measured have an elevated PTH at baseline? And this may be a whole different group of patients to study because people who have elevated PTHs may have different responses to these medications, and we just don't know that. Other anabolic agents may have um, different effects. So this is the data that I'm going to present um, this week, um, and that is the safety, efficacy of safety Aromo, 210 milligrams sub-Q a month, versus placebo in patients with CKD. And you know, all, come, this is the analysis from the FRAME trial. There are two major trials for romososomob approval. The ARCH trial, which compared Romo with alitronate, and the FRAME trial, uh, published by Felicia Costin uh, in the New England Journal, uh, and, and uh, Felicia with Columbia with John, and you had uh, people who received Romo 210 milligrams uh, a month or placebo uh, injections per month. 
And this is the, this is the data here, so the 12 month data. What we saw along, uh, again, very similar, along these tertiles of GFR, 30 to 59, 60 to 89, probably similar increases in bone density in the green with Romo as compared to placebo that were significant across all these groups. And, you know, one of my criticisms of the data is the fact that we know that sclerosis levels go up, the decreased GFR, and Amgen never measured sclerosis levels in this population to see whether or not there was a different effect at a higher, if you had a, if you had a floating around sclerosin, and you give them on, <laughs> would there be a difference? The incidence of new vertebral fractures uh, were similar between the ROMO as a subset of the patients who had different tertiles of GFR. And of course, the, the, the major concern, because this is a population of people who may have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, although again, these are people with age-related reductions in GFR, which might be a whole different ballgame. Let's say a diabetic who's got ischemic heart disease, maybe asymptomatic, and functions in GFR. That's, that, 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 that's a criticism of the data. But here, when you take a look at the hazardous ratio with their 95% confidence intervals as a function of different levels of tertiles of GFR on the left-hand side, uh, the... Uh, p-value for treatment by subgroup interaction was not significant. So it didn't look like there was a different cardiovascular strokes or heart attacks in this particular group of people, like there was seen in the overall population, particularly with the Romo group as compared to placebo. And that's why they got the black box warning. So the off-label use of antiresorptants or anabolic in very high-risk patients in, in stage four to five CKD very high risk people who have fractures. Mortality is high because of their fractures. And we're in post hoc analysis. Bisphosphonates, raloxifen, HT, DMAB, teriparatide, or baloperatide, and I have to add the Romo, have been shown to reduce fractures down to 30. Stage five, there's no data. It's all opinion. A lot of that's on a national level, it's my opinion. But I see these people, and, and they're very sick people. So I use an off, a lot of off-label things in this group of patients. Um, bisphosphonate use, no data on benefit or harm. Use o in very specific circumstances, fragility fractures where you have ruled out aid dynamic bone disease to your best of your ability, osteomalacia, severe hyperparathyroid bone disease. Bone retention over time is unknown. Theoretically, it'll be higher because bisphosphonates are clear by the kidney, but no one's ever studied that because you just can't measure bisphosphonate concentrations in bone. The effect of reducing bone turnover by any agent on, that reduces turnover on cardiovascular is unknown. In the PM trials with observational studies, bisphosphonates reduce all-cause mortality. That's a very interesting, but that's in the PMO trials, not with GFRs. So in stage one to three CKD, manage your patient as you would for anybody else. Shouldn't differ. Stage four to five, screen with a differential diagnosis, bone tender markers, particularly PTH and BSAP, and serum phosphorus to try to discriminate biochemically to rule out adynamic bone disease or osteomalacia. Osteomalacia, we think that's there because the BSCP is high. They don't have pagets. Then um, you've got a differential, what, you know, the causes of osteomalacia. Fractured four to five C CKD without biochemical evidence suggesting osteomalacia or adynamic bone disease. Treat on label with DMAB or off label with bisphosphonates particularly if the PTH is not above that six levels of higher of a limit than normal. Fractured four to five CKD that you don't know the turnover or with lower, P or, or lower tertiles of PTH, treat with an anabolic agent first. So I don't think you're gonna hurt anybody with that. So that's my gish. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. How to do on time? 15 minutes over. Really?
Oh my God, I'm sorry. Um, any questions? Pardon me? When do, when do you treat patients after they come to uh, this practice? When do I treat them? Yeah, when do you give a treatment? Do they stop treating? Or you well, after I, after I work them up, I have to make sure they don't have other diseases. If they are fractured, make sure they don't have adenomic bone disease, uh -huh. at, least by B, B, at least by BSAP and PTH. Uh, I treat them as soon as I can. Oh, okay. okay. You know? So you're not waiting for a patient to come in? No. I mean, these are fracture patients are sick. I mean, you know, you know, even in the regular postmenopausal off population or the male patients, if they've had a, fra a vertebral fracture, the risk of the second fracture, one out of four will fracture again within a year. And it's a very high risk group. As a matter of fact, when people have come in and they have a bone density with a T score of minus one, two, they're osteopenic, they have a fracture, I say throw the DEXA out. Frac this is not a political term. Fractures trump T scores. I mean, really, they, they, uh, fracture patients need to get worked up and treated. That's, that's the simple phrase of keep in your mind. Okay, uh, listen, I'll hang around. I'm here with you all the rest of the day. Thanks.